you. Hi, everybody. Oh, uh, it's a, good to be home. Oh, it's so good to be home. My eyes are barely working. Um, and uh, thank you all for coming. Fourth of July is uh, one of those weekends when a lot of people are away. So I'm so glad that you're here today. Um, I'm going, it, it, I don't know that everyone knows, but I've been away for uh, nearly two weeks to Salt Lake City for the General Convention of the Episcopal Church. And I'm going to review all of that on the last Sunday of the month, I think. I may, don't I hold that because we, we want to bring Sam back too. But uh, I'll, I'll do that before too long and, and go through all the stuff that we did. It was a tremendous, tremendous couple of weeks. And I, let me do just a short version. Um, I am so proud to be an Episcopalian. It has been, it's so good to see the church at work. Um, there's so much energy and creativity in the church. And um, I was very proud of uh, our church opening marriage to all. Um, well, and lots of other stuff. We'll talk about that, though, when, uh, when we do that. But what we're doing today, um, if Lowell Grisham had a list of the, say, 10 folks you most admire and respect, Sam Totten is on that list. Sam is a nationally, internationally known genocide scholar. And uh, if you read our e-news, you know that on several occasions he has gone to the Nuba Mountains. He has risked his life to try to bring relief to people who are, um, are uh, trying to be, who are being eliminated by starvation. It's, it's an awful thing. And uh, Sam has been trying to bring this to the world's attention and consciousness now for several years. Um, Sam has gotten Christoph, um, um, Nicholas Kristoff's attention now, it appears, and that's good to see. And I guess I would put him on a list of Nobel Prize, Peace Prize uh, potentials. It's an honor, it's a treat to have Sam here to talk a little bit about some of his passion and some of what I hope will become your passion. This church has contributed some to Sam's missions and we want to continue to help support the work of trying to bring uh, peace and reconciliation to the people of the Nuba Mountains. Sam Totten, and Sam's married to Kathleen Barta, who many of you know, one of our parishioners. <laughs> and uh, she's wonderful too. Thank Welcome you very much, Paul. So glad Thank you're you. here. Well, thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, thank you, Lowell, so much for your kind words and for the invitation, and thank you all for being here. What I'd like to do initially is just give you a quick overview uh, about what the situation is in the, uh, the Nuba Mountains, how it came about. I want to do that very, as, succinctly as, as succinctly as I possibly can. Then what I'd like to do is go to the photographs that I've taken uh, talk about those briefly, and then share with you some of the uh, some of the situations that I've uh, ended up in as a result of going to the Nuba Mountains. And I really want to focus not so much on my own story, but the story of the of the Nuba Mountains people. Uh, again, succinctly stated, I, the Nuba Mountains is in the basically in the middle of Sudan. In fact, Lowell, I think we may have, uh, well, this is a picture of the Nuba Mountains. Uh, it actually, the Nuba Mountains look different depending on where you're at. Uh, most recently, I've been going up to the front where the, the fighting is taking place. It looks radically different than this. This is just across the border from South Sudan. This is what it looks like. Uh, but if we could go one more, I think I had a map. Well, I guess I didn't. Um, well, I'll come back to this in a minute. So. In the uh, 1980s, the people in southern Sudan comprised of Christians, animists, and Muslims ended up fighting Khartoum, the government of Sudan. And the reason they did is that they felt dis uh, disenfranchised in just about every way possible, economically, politically, socially. They, at that particular time, uh, there was pressure on them to uh, shut down churches, shut down mosques if they were not fundamentalist because the government was talking about establishing Sharia law, uh, fundamentalist uh, Islamic law. And 
Uh, they were very upset about that. Obviously, if you're a Christian, you're, you're not going to want to give up your faith. Uh, a lot of the Muslims were moderate Muslims. Uh, they did not want to live under Sharia law. So that was one thing. But politically, they felt disenfranchised because while they paid taxes, they had virtually no representation in the government. And economically, they felt disenfranchised. They had virtually no bridges, and you cannot get anywhere during the rainy season without bridges because they have these wadis, dry riverbeds during the uh, dry season, but they become torrential during the rainy season. And the rainy season goes from uh, May through November. Right now, in the Nuba Mountains, you cannot get anywhere, even with four-wheel drive. You basically end up sinking because it, everything turns to mud. Uh, so no bridges, people even walking cannot go good distances. Uh, they cannot often take their food to the souks, the open markets. It was a problem. Uh, there were no hospitals at that time in this region. There were few schools. There were virtually no roads. And when I talk roads, when I'm talking roads, there were no asphalt roads. There aren't today. But there were not any even graded roads. Uh, and to give you an example of what I'm talking about today, 2015, there's a single hospital in the Nuba Mountains for one million, a, a million and a half people. One hospital. At that hospital, there's one surgeon, the only surgeon in the Nuba Mountains. He happens to be an American who was educated at Duke uh, University Medical School. He's been up there about, uh, since about 2009. Uh, very, very dedicated, obviously. Um, but he is the only surgeon in that entire region. And so things are better today than they were in the 1980s. So anyways, long story short, the South started fighting Khartoum. Slowly but surely, the fighting edged up into the Nuba Mountains. And the Nuba people found themselves being encroached upon by the fighters, both from the south as well as from the north. Ultimately, the Nuba Mountains joined with the people in the south to fight Khartoum. And at that time, basically what they wanted was their basic human rights. Education, health, uh, uh, political representation, etc. That war went on from 1983 through 2005. Over two million people were killed. What, what is remarkable to me, I don't remember hearing about that. And I've been concerned about international human rights since about 1976 when I joined Amnesty International. So it was really mind-boggling to me to find out about this war that had been going on for 20 plus years, so many people being killed, and really no spotlight zeroed in on this. Now, in the late 19, well, in the 1990s, the government of Sudan decided to apply incredible pressure on the people in the Nuba Mountains. And what I mean is they began bombing the farms. And they bombed the people off the farms. The people went up into the mountains. They left their farms. The people who didn't go up in the mountains uh, were arrested and placed on what they called so-called peace camps. They were concentration camps. Mainly women and children and the elderly were placed into these peace camps. The women basically became concubine for the soldiers of the government of Sudan. The children were taken away, all of them, and put into fundamentalist schools. The people who went up into the mountains had no food. Only what they carried up, which did not last long, and this began in the late 1890s, I mean, <laughs> 1980s, late 1980s, and went into the 1990s, well into the 1990s. And after not very long, these people started resorting to eating leaves, grasses, uh, roots of plants. And that's what, basically what they existed on for years. They, they became so... Um, desperate that they even began 
eating leaves and roots that they knew were poisonous. What they would do is that they would take these roots, these leaves, they would boil them, they would strain that water out, they would boil them a second time, strain that water, boil them a third time, pull them out, dry the leaves, the roots, etc., pound them into a uh, kind of granules, and then put them in a pot again, and if they had any sorghum, which is the mainstay of their diet, they would throw some sorghum in, and that's what they would eat. A lot of people ended up dying of starvation, particularly the elderly and the very, very young, because their systems couldn't take uh, this so-called food that they were eating. And so a lot of people ended up starving uh, during this period of time. Well, in the late 1990s, the international community came together to try to work out a peace in this region. Finally, in 2005, something called the Comprehensive Peace Agreement was agreed upon by the two main actors, and that is the government of Sudan and the Sudanese People Liberation Movement slash Army of the South. And the CPA basically stated this. If the people in the South wanted to, they could hold a referendum to decide whether they stayed with Sudan or seceded. If they stayed with Sudan, purportedly there was going to be a new Sudan with more, uh, well, let's put it this way, with uh, equal rights for everyone. These people, by 99.4% voted in favor of seceding. So, in 2011, they became the new Republic of South Sudan, the newest nation among the nations of the world. And here's the problem as far as the Nuba are concerned. They fought with the South, but they were cut out of this comprehensive peace agreement. Basically, what was stated is, we'll deal with you later, meaning the Nuba, because the government of Sudan said, we do not want this region, the Nuba Mountains, to go with the South. And so, to this day, the Nuba remains under the dictatorship of Omar al-Bashir, the very same dictator that was fighting the war in the 1990s. And these people were very, very upset about this because they've been threatened by the government of Sudan. Uh, al-Bashir, who is wanted by the International Criminal Court on charges of genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity for, uh, for crimes that were perpetrated in Darfur in the early part of the century, ended up appointing as governor of the state of South Cordovan, which is where the Nuba Mountains are located, he ended up appointing a person named Ahmed Haroun, governor. The Nuba people were absolutely beside themselves because Ahmed Haroun is wanted on 23 charges of crimes against humanity, 22 war, uh, charges of war crimes, again, for atrocities perpetrated in Darfur. So all of a sudden, they have a war criminal as their governor. Every time the Nuba people uh, asserted themselves, stating, look, we don't want Ahmed Haroun as governor. We want to go with the South. If we can't go with the South, we want to secede. Every time they said something like this, they were threatened by Omar al-Bashir. The last threat was, I am, this is al-Bashir speaking now, I'm going to establish Sharia law across this entire nation. So again, the threat of Sharia law is hanging over the people of the Nuba Mountains. And it, it was threat after threat after threat. Finally, the Nuba Mountains people said, well, we're going to pick up our weapons again, and this time what we're going to do is we're going all the way to Khartoum. That's what they tell me all the time. And what they basically mean by that is, we're going to go to Khartoum and we're going to overthrow the government this time. And so the fighting ha uh, started in June 2011, and it continues to this day. Now, where I got involved in this 
is I had been doing research up in the Nuba Mountains in uh, 2010, before the war, and, because I had heard that there was an uh, internally displaced persons camp with people from Darfur, and I had been studying Darfur since 2004. And uh, it just so happened I met some people on a plane in uh, Nairobi who said, hey, we can get you into the Nuba Mountains. And, because I had just explained to him, as we're sitting on this plane in Nairobi, that I'd been trying for uh, about six years to get into Sudan, and they wouldn't give me a visa. So he said, and I told him that. I said, hey, I don't have a visa, so that's going to be a problem. He said, no, no, no. I, I have access to an NGO, non-governmental organization flight that flies into the Nuba Mountains, and when you fly in, it lands on a piece of land. It's not an airport. You get off, there's no customs there, and you can just walk into the village, and that's it. So I said, great, and that's what I did. But as I was conducting this research into Darfur, I kept bumping into more and more people who had experienced this malnutrition, severe malnutrition, and hunger, I mean, uh, starvation during the uh, 1990s, and I started interviewing them. So I started returning. And I think it was the second or third time I was in the Nuba Mountains. Uh, it was around Christmas time. There were rumors of war. So this was about six months before war broke out. But there were rumors that war was going to break out because of the threats of the government. In June 2011, the war broke out. So I already obviously was primed to have a real interest in the Nuba people and what was happening because I had ended up publishing a book of interviews uh, about this, what is called genocide by attrition, basically where the government bombed the people, forced them into the mountains, the people had no food, and they had to exist on leaves, roots, so on and so forth. What happened, though, is this, is the war started in June 2011, by September, October, November, it was obvious that what the people had suffered in the 1990s, they were beginning to suffer again. That is, there were daily bombings against them on their farms, and I'm talking civilians now, not rebels, and these people again were going up into the mountains, away from their stores of food, away from their farms, and they had no food. I heard, it was a rumor, in uh, January of uh, 2012, that both the United Nations and the United States were considering the implementation of a humanitarian corridor into the Nuba Mountains. The plan was to go from South Sudan up to the Nuba Mountains to carry food. That rumor went on, in January, February, March, April, and all of a sudden in May, there was no more talk about it. And basically what Al Bashir had said during this period of time, if anybody comes across the border, will slice their throat if they don't have permission to come over. So to this day, from 2011, and we're obviously in July 2015, no international organization uh, not USA, USAID from the United States, not the World Food Program, nobody is in the Nuba Mountains because they don't want to be attacked by al-Bashir. And when I heard that, I decided, well, you know, it's easy to sit behind a computer and write about genocide. And I'm not calling this a genocide, I'm saying that this may lead to at least a genocide by attrition, what we saw in the 1990s. I thought, well, you know, it, it's one thing to write about it, it's another thing to talk about bystanders. Everybody who writes about genocide or the Holocaust always talks about bystanders. And I finally came to the conclusion, I'm not, I don't want to be a bystander, I know I have access to get up into the mountains, let's see what I can do. And so I joined with the team initially, six guys from around the United States. Uh, we be, began raising money. The first time we raised about 50,000 USD. Um, and uh, guys tried to go in in May. I told them, the rainy season, you're not going to get far. They got about 10 miles, and their truck ended up bogged down. And then they started hiking in. They did not get far. They didn't carry much food. And so when the rainy season was over, I said, all right, I'll give it a shot. And at that time, we uh, purchased food in Kampala, 
had it trucked down, and then I went with the truck. Uh, well, we also picked up additional food, and I went up into the Nuba Mountains, and that was the first time I delivered uh, food up there. I've been back three times since. Now, what's really interesting is, each and every time, of course, I learn more and more about what's happening on the ground. Uh, and there are some really stark things that are happening on the ground. Let me just share a couple with you, then we'll look at the photos, and then if you want, uh, we can ask questions. The last time I was there was in, an eight, was in April of this year. And uh, I'd already been to the, to the front where there was heavy uh, bombing by uh, Antonov uh, planes. They're basically planes of the Sudanese government. They're cargo planes that are, that are retrofitted to serve as bombers, and they purchased them from Ukraine. Uh, there was daily bombing up there. And what they do is, is uh, they generally go in and they bomb uh, areas that are, that are crowded with people. So uh, villages, obviously, souks, the open markets, schools, churches, mosques. Uh, we went up and delivered food, uh, and the attacks were ongoing. Uh, and probably, probably the most frightening experience I've ever had, just to mention this, is we were heading up to this place called Qualib, uh, which again is r relatively close to, to Khartoum, about as close as you can get in the Nuba Mountains to Khartoum without going into the territory of the uh, government soldiers. And uh, we went through a town called Hebon, and we were about 20 minutes out of Hebon, and some guy, there were three or four people up on a knoll. Now, as I mentioned, there, there are roads today that are graded, but no asphalt. So we're going along this dusty road. It's basically a one-lane road. And this guy comes running down this hill, screaming at us. I mean, he was, he was angry. Uh, and we weren't sure why. We stopped. Um, and he started screaming at us, how come you didn't stop and tell us that a, uh, a fighter jet had attacked Hebon. He knew that we had been in Hebon because there's only one way to go, and you had to go through Hebon. And we said, what are you talking about? We were just there, you know, 20 minutes ago. Uh, we didn't, you know, we didn't see a jet, we didn't hear a jet, uh, we don't know anything about it, so we continued on our way. When we got back to Kauda, which is the main town um, in the Nuba Mountains, we had to go back through Hebon, we heard that, in fact, a jet had attacked about 15 or 20 minutes after we had gone through. Now, what was interesting was this was a, a Sunday morning, and there was nobody out in this village, and we weren't sure why. Thinking, well, hey, maybe people sleep in, because it was daylight, but it was very, very odd. Uh, in fact, I wanted to get a drink. Uh, I'm always thirsty up there. I always want uh, cool water if I could find it, and there, we couldn't find anything. But when we got back to Kauta, we heard that, in fact, this jet had attacked. Uh, the pilot obvi obviously saw these three young men running towards a hole. And everybody in the Nuba Mountains now has dug holes that are about eight feet deep. And so when the Antonovs or jets come, everybody runs to these holes and jumps in. And generally, you're pretty safe, because eight feet down, the shrapnel is going to fly over your head. And before I forget, This is what I'm talking about. I, I picked this up. I picked this up um, up in Qualib. I picked up a lot of pieces, and this is the stuff that hits people. And it basically, and I don't know any other way to put this, grinds people up to the point where they look like hamburger. It shears off arms, heads, legs. I mean, it's wicked stuff because it's flying off of these bombs at a pretty good rate, and this stuff is sharp as can be. Well, what happened is two of the kids made it to the hole, one didn't. And I met some guys, Americans who were up there, who went to the kid's funeral. And I didn't know about the funeral. They went to the funeral uh, that week, and they told me that the kids had literally been cut in half. And when they buried them, the father had the two halves of the kid to bury. This is typical of the situation. 
four or five days after this, um, I'd heard about an inter internally displaced persons camp where there were people who uh, had just arrived, who didn't have food. I wanted to go up to meet them. I wanted to see what their situation was. I went up, found some people who uh, were leaders of this IDP camp. They told me what they didn't have. I said, all right, we'll bring in, uh, uh, we'll try to get you four or five, about, no, three or four tons of food tomorrow. They really wanted soap as well. I said, we'll get soap. They wanted salt. I said, we'll get salt, sugar, sorghum, um, dried beans, lentils, if we could find it. And I said, we'll be back the next day. Well, I heard there was a souk that was open that day. The market, marketplaces are open on different days. So just about, I don't know, 10 miles north, a souk was open. So I thought, well, I'll go up there because sometimes they have these merchants who have these huge bags, 200-pound bags that they're willing to sell. And so I went up there. As soon as we pulled in to this souk, I see this jeep racing with soldiers and this huge weapon. The bullets were this big. They were racing across this field. Dust was flying everywhere. And I, told, I, I asked my driver, Daniel, I said, what do you think these guys are doing? You know, uh, because it looked like they were you know, just being kind of wild characters, which is atypical of these rebels because I've never had a problem with the rebels. They've always been polite, very nice, um, very serious. And so we're sitting there, and we're getting ready to go into this souk. Somebody runs over to us and said, look, a kid stepped on a landmine. Uh, he was out picking mangoes to bring to his family, and he stepped on a landmine, and the soldiers are trying to find somebody to take this kid to a, a clinic. Now, there are clinics in, uh, they're very small health clinics in the Nuba Mountains, and I said, look, we'll take him to the hospital because... And the hospital is called Mother of Mercy. It's a uh, hospital that is sponsored by the Catholic Church. And I knew where it was. I'd been there. I, I know the surgeon. His name is Tom Katina. And I also knew that the, the closest clinic was not much closer than this, um, than this hospital. We took off. We propped his legs up. Because his legs, he had a leg wound that just about sheared his leg off. But the, but the blood was dry, but we still uh, put his legs up. Um, I told the people, I gave him some uh, wet cloths and water. I said, don't give him anything to drink, but wipe his face down, wipe his arms down, and we took off. Long story short, we got about three-quarters of the way there. We had his sister in the truck. We had a neighbor in the truck. They were sitting in the back. This is a pickup. Uh, about three-quarters of the way there, he started going downhill. We didn't know this because we were racing. We get to the uh, hospital. I go in and see Tom Katina. He says, bring the truck right on in to the courtyard. He took a quick look at the kid. He said, I think he's alive. He said, let me go get a, um, uh, a stretcher on wheels. Uh, he said, we'll pull him in. He comes back out. We start to put the kid on the stretcher, and he whispers to me, he's dead. And what he did is, he said, let, let me do this. He said, let me take the, the, this young man in. He's 12 years old. Let me take him in, let me do an autopsy, and then I'll come back and I'll tell his sister. He takes him in, and my driver and I were welcome to go in. I thought, no, you know, I really don't want to. Uh, so I sat outside. My driver did go in, and uh, they were in there for about 20 minutes. When Daniel came out, the driver, he, I said, well, I said, it must have been tough to watch. And he said, yeah, it was. And he said, not only was his leg basically mash, that is bone and gristle and muscle and blood all together, but he had a gigantic wound right here. And he said, uh, Dr. Katina, it was so big that he, he could pu put his fist in and go towards the sternum. He said, there was no way that the kid would have lived. So anyway, as long story short, he comes out, he tells his sister, um, the neighbor, and I mean, obviously, you know, they're more than distraught, obviously. I mean, very, you know, I mean, just a very, very sad situation. And uh, so we decided to take the child back to the parents so they could bury him. Uh, the parents had heard about this. Uh, nobody has cars, trucks out there, and they were running to this hospital. It took us 45 minutes, and they were running to the hospital across this field. 
The man was in front of the woman by about 300 yards or so. We pull up to the man, the father. He comes over. He looks in the back of his son. He doesn't say anything. He walks out into a field by himself, not towards his wife. And when his wife saw him walking out into the field, she screamed and fell flat on her face and screamed for the next 15 or 20 minutes. We finally got her into the truck and, and took her into Kauta, the main village, and they were going to bury the young man that night. Uh, this is kind of a microcosm, unfortunately, of what is happening in the Nuba Mountains. I've got more stories to tell about people that I've bumped into and what's happening, um, but why don't I show some of these, uh, these uh, photos. I'll comment on those briefly, and then if you have questions, how's that? so we can get uh, uh, a little better view of the, of the film, of the videos. All right, so here, here we have the, the Nuba Mountains. There are, there are caves just throughout the Nuba Mountains. And what people do is they go up to these caves, and you can see these children. They live up there when the bombing is taking place. And the, the situation with these bombings is they are daily. When I was there last year in December, there were approximately 250 bombings the two weeks I was there. So they're bombing more than once a day. And so what they do is they go up, and when they hear these Antonovs, the planes, and generally it's Antonovs, not jets, so the jets are just recently have begun to fly into the Nuba Mountains. You can hear these Antonovs from far off. When they hear the Antonovs, they go into the caves and they wait until the plane has gone by or until it's bombed something. It was very strange because it must have been three years ago the Antonovs were coming over pretty regularly when I was there, and it was very strange because they, they came in the morning. And you know how you are here. You hear a plane, you might look up. You think, well... You know, it's going to Highfield or maybe Dallas or something. And I was sitting in this little, it's called a tukul, what people live in. And I was thinking, hmm, I wonder where the plane's going. All of a sudden it dawned on me that this is a no-fly zone. The only people flying overhead are these bombers. And, I, and then I took off and jumped in one of these holes. So, but this is what these people face every single day. Uh, this is, these are kind of out of order, but it doesn't matter. Um, this was the first trip I took. This is uh, unloading food. Uh, you can see the sacks are pretty heavy. Those things are uh, weigh between about 150 and uh, 200 pounds. But this was just a small amount of food that we were taking up because we had this truck coming in from uh, Camp Paula as well. Uh, but what we did is we dropped it off with the commissioner of Cauda, who then met with uh, what they referred to as the sheikhs, the local leaders. And I made it very clear to them. I said, the only reason I'm doing this is because I understand that there are people up in the mountains, away from these towns, away from the souks, who are starving. I said, I want to get this food to those people. This isn't just to bring in uh, for just anybody, because in these towns, people were generally eating, but out, they weren't. Uh, I did meet people, plenty of people in towns who were eating once a day, and they were complaining about that, and you know, rightly so. But the people out in the mountains, they were not eating for days. And so I made it very clear, and I also made it very clear, this stuff's not for sale. And so we, you know, we had that agreement, and they were very pleased uh, to uh, distribute it. Uh, when I was coming out of the Nuba Mountains, this was, uh, I think this was 2011. I was coming out, and I was just getting ready to cross over into uh, South Sudan. Now, when I go in... It's a long, long trip. I have to fly from here to Nairobi. In Nairobi, I either take a, a, a long-distance bus that takes over 24 hours to get to the town of Juba, or I take a flight to Juba, which is the capital of South Sudan. When I get there, I have to then catch, uh, there are no commercial flights where I'm going, so I have to catch a flight with the uh, World Food Program or uh, some uh, non-governmental organization that's flying in, uh, generally with a... Um, a cargo plane. So I fly then to a refugee camp called Yida, and from there, 
I meet my driver, and then we cross over the border illegally because I don't have a visa, but I do have the okay from the rebels. And so what I do is I travel through rebel territory. There are these roadblocks about every 10, 12, 15 miles where you have to stop, show your paperwork, and then you're allowed to go on. Well, these guys had just come out of fighting near the capital of South Cordovan, the state of South Cordovan, and uh, I told my uh, interpreter, I said, I've got to get a picture of these guys. He said, no, 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 you're going to be in trouble. You know, you'll cause us all sorts of problems. I said, no, 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 I don't think so. So I went up and started talking to them, and I, they ended up being the nicest guys. I said, hey, I, I'd like a photo. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, you know, here they are. Uh, they were, again, they were very nice, even though they had just come out. They had just gotten back that very morning, I guess. This is a piece of shrapnel. The shrapnel looks all, they're all different kinds of shrapnel. Um, and this one I found outside of Cauda. Actually, I was traveling with a uh, rebel commander who was the, um, was the commander of the only anti-aircraft gun in all Nuba Mountains. And so uh, he asked for a lift up to this town. And then when we got up there, he started taking me around. And he said, this is what the people were being killed with. Uh, again, this is, uh, this is a, a picture. You can see the soldiers snaking way back. These are rebels. Uh, this is from 2011. They're just getting ready to go to battle. Uh, okay, we don't want to see these. Yeah, okay, great, thank you. That's great. Um, let, let me just go back uh, one trip, and then we'll open it up. We'll have about 15, 20 minutes. Uh, you know, it's one thing to hear about these bombs and what transpires when they come. Uh, I was travel after uh, offloading some food, I was traveling to another uh, community to deliver more food. And uh, we had just met with a commissioner of the local region. And uh, we uh, went and uh, got some water uh, to drink in this little uh, tree covered area. All of a sudden, an Antonov comes over. Everybody, and there must have been 15 people, everybody takes off. I t just all different ways. I took off as fast as I could. There were two kids, uh, a girl and a, uh, and a boy in front of me. I mean, I almost ran them over, but I didn't. And we went down this embankment into a uh, wadi that was dry and uh, parked ourselves as close as we could to the wall of the wadi, and this thing flew over. So... We got back up, we walked back into this little area where this woman had a little tea stand um, in trees, like I said. We sat down. Everybody, of course, is talking about you know, the close call because this thing was low in the sky. So we're talking. All of a sudden, it circles back around. And usually when these things circle back around, that means that they're most likely going to drop bombs uh, because they've seen people. And it comes back. We take off, everybody takes off again. And I head the same way, and all of a sudden, as I'm getting ready to go down this embankment, some guy yells out, Kawaja, which means white man. Kawaja, get down, get down. I'm going down the hill, and I'm thinking, oh my God, do I get down here? I mean, this is all really fast. Do I get down here, or do I keep going? But the one thing that I learned over the past several years is the people who were killed are those who are standing up because this shrapnel is flying and hitting them and like I said, uh, you know, doing horrific damage to them if not killing them. I go flat down, felt totally exposed, and the plane goes over again. I get up and I see my interpreter on the ground. And what's in, what was interesting about this is uh, the two previous trips, he refused to get into these holes, and he used to mock me for getting into them. And I, you know, it kind of irritated me, to say the least. Uh, but I continued to get in the hole. So I said, what are you doing on the ground? He said, this one was too close. So we all ended up laughing about that. Long story short, we got into our vehicle, and three more times, uh, Antonovs came over. And by that time, we had 19 people on the back of the truck. We were uh, carrying a lot of them down to Cauda, I mean, down to Yida refugee camp. There was a young man, about 19 on the back, 
who had his right arm sheared off. And I had asked him. I met him uh, at a souk about a half an hour before this. And I said, he asked me for a ride uh, to the Yida refugee camp. And I asked, why are you going there? And he said, um, all the schools are closed here. I want to finish my high school education. And I know that they have a secondary school down there. So I said, well, what happened to your arm? And he said, Antonov. That's all he said. That's all he had to say. Well, he was one of the 19 on the back of this truck. And every time one of these Antonovs came over, and, and I'm not saying this uh, to be funny, he was like a piece of popcorn. He was the first one who jumped up, and everybody just took off after this kid jumped up. And uh, so what I've seen is ever-increasing, uh, more and more bombings now, and uh, more and more jets coming in. And on that trip that I just talked about, the entire time we saw walls of smoke where uh, these jets had come in and bombed a village, basically decimated the place, cleared it out. And the day before, I had traveled with uh, a group of rebels that, uh, because I had heard that a couple of villages had been bombed. And so I had to ask permission to go out there, and they said, well, hey, we'll take you out. So we traveled for the afternoon. They took me out to, a vill to four villages in a row. The ground was blackened. I, we got out. I put my hand down. It was still warm. We went through each of these villages, and they were ghost towns. There was not a single individual. And I said, where are these people going? He said, out into the desert, makeshift uh, IDP camps, internally displaced camps, up into the mountains. He said, they're clearing out. And this is a regular thing, day after day after day. Uh, so what I know now, the positive thing is, is that there now, I, I know, about three different three or four different groups of individuals, they're either bringing in food, food and medicine, or medicine. And interestingly, they're all Americans. And you get to know everybody up there because, I mean, I will go for weeks up there and not see a, another Kawaja, white person. And when you do, obviously, you know, you end up saying, well, hey, what are you doing up here? And every person I've met is, and I haven't met many, are doing something on the behalf of the Nuba Mountains. I'm going to end on that note because we just have a few minutes, but I do want to say this. I cannot thank Lowell and the congregation enough for the support that uh, St. Paul's has given to this project to get food up there. Because as I tell the people, hey, all I'm doing is delivering the food, but it's the people of Fayetteville, Arkansas, around Arkansas, and then, you know, friends here and there, some scholars of genocide studies who are contributing to this effort, and I, and I tell them, I said, you know, uh, I tell them about the people, I tell them about St. Paul's, and I go, hey, this is not me, people in the United States who have heard about this, at least some people, care enough uh, to donate money to get food for you, and uh, I have to say, uh, they are extremely appreciative uh, very gracious in, in thanking, obviously, Americans. Uh, you never hear anything bad about Americans out there, ever. Uh, so I wanted to say that. I mean, St. Paul's has been incredible, so thank you so much. So questions? Yeah, let, me, let me mention, it, it seems to me, Sam, what a wonderful thing to talk about on the 5th of July. <laughs> we are the folks in the, the one country in the world that are trying to help these people with their fight for independence. Uh, you couldn't That's ask true. for that something is true. better to think about. Uh, and also to mention, I've been a little out of the loop because I've been away from newspapers, but I think Nicholas Kristof has the third article that he's written, third of three, yeah. uh, in the New York Times. So um, go online if you don't take the New York Times and, and, and see what Nicholas Kristof has been writing. Yeah, Kristof, uh, he's been up there several times. In fact, when I got back in April, um, I sent Nick uh, the report that I write. I always write up a report in regard to what happened uh, on the ground, how much food was uh, transported in. And he wrote back, he said, Dear Sam, uh, I'm going to be following in your uh, footsteps. And basically what he meant is he was going up about two weeks later. Um, and he went up to Cauda. I know he saw Tom Katina, the uh, doctor that I mentioned. So, yeah, Kristoff's uh, great because obviously a lot of people read the New York Times uh, and uh, he's really helped to get the message out. So that's yeah. wonderful. And so some of your pledges, um, 
have gone to do help with this. Thanks for your gifts to, to St. Paul's. And if you'd like to continue, uh, if you want to give gifts uh, for this, just put, put Nuba Mountains on any check to St. Paul's and we make sure that it helps fund uh, the relief efforts there. Questions that people might have? Yeah. yeah. Hey, Peter? First of all, thank you for the work that you're doing. It's uh, incredible. Uh, well, thank you. Putting yourself in harm's way that way. It, uh, you're doing God's work, no question about that. Um, I guess I guess this cries out for, is there, in, uh, from my perspective, is there an answer to this? Is there a political solution? Is there a road to peace here, or is this just going to continue on for another 20 years? Yeah, you know, that's, that's a great question. In fact, um, one of the... This was I, probably about four years ago. I met this rebel who had been uh, uh, shot. He was back at his uh, family's home, and I interviewed him. And one of the things he kept saying is, hey, we're going all the way to Khartoum. And I said, what does that mean? He said, we're going to Khartoum. We're going to overthrow al-Bashir, the dictator, and we're going to establish our own government. And I said, yeah, and uh, then what? He said, we're going to create basic human rights for everybody. And I said, well, you know, that's interesting that you say that because that's exactly what the people in the new country of the Republic of South Sudan said, and they're already fighting. Uh, they're killing one another. So, you know, and there are so many different groups in this country, Sudan. How are you sure you're going to do that? He says, I know we're going to do that. Um, my, the reason I made that point is, is that the rebels really seem intransigent right now. Uh, they're not really open to uh, uh, calls for peace because they don't trust uh, al-Bashir. Uh, they know what's going on in Darfur, as probably all of you know, in, in the early part of this century, 2003, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, uh, some 300,000 people were killed in Darfur, in Sudan, by this same regime of al-Bashir. Nobody is really focusing on what's happening in Darfur today. But the killing over the past two years has risen. Uh, humanitarian groups have been pushed out. They've been killed. Um, I know this general from Rwanda who I became very good friends with, who ended up as the deputy commander of the UN uh, African Union force there. He told me that they, are, they have so many restrictions on them, meaning this peace force, that it's ludicrous. He said that before they can go in to a hot area fighting, because they've had to rent helicopters from a private organization because no governments have loaned helicopters, they have to call into Khartoum and inform them where they want to fly. Half the time they're not allowed. Uh, he said, they, well, they're on, I know this, they're on a mandate which is called a chapter six, which means peacekeeping versus Peace Enforcement Chapter 7, he said, we can't go out and fight. All we can do is pretty much protect ourselves. He said, I can tell you this as well. He said, the peacekeepers always rush back to the base before nightfall because they're fearful. And, and, I, and he said, the reason for that is the Peace Force is outgunned, outmanned, and outresourced. Uh, Al-Bashir, on the other hand, um, keeps saying that he wants peace. And yet, every time there's a movement towards it, he steps back, makes a threat. Then there's a counter threat by the rebels. And I asked this rebel, I said, you know that this civil war, is, it was the second Sudanese civil war from 83 to 2005, resulted in 2 million deaths and went on for 20 plus years. I said, are you telling me that you're willing to fight for, let's say, the next 20 years? And, uh, and lose a million plus people? He said, we'll fight for 40 years. My sense is there's not going to be peace for quite a while. And my concern is, is when I go in, I am going to help the civilians, not the rebels. I never give food to the rebels. Not that, you know, not that I'm against the rebels, but the, P, the civilians are the ones who are suffering, particularly the children and, and uh, the elderly and the women. Um, and those are the people who are going to ultimately suffer horrifically, whether it's the next two years, three years, four years, whatever. I don't see anything happening for a while. Not, and, and even if al-Bashir Al is replaced, uh, I don't see that helping a whole lot. And this is one of those that is so hard for Americans to um, 
absorbed, there just doesn't seem like there's a way to fix this. Yeah. And we need to quit on that mo on that uh, right. that word. Sam, thank you, thank you, thank you for well, thank all you. that you were doing and have done. We're so proud of you, and thank you for coming to share this with us. Well, thank you, thank you for coming. I. Again, I, I greatly appreciate it. I can't thank you enough. I can't uh, thank you little enough, St. Paul's, really. Uh, you've been terrific and uh, just absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yes, Suzanne. Yes, um, if, if you give a gift to St. Paul's and put Nuba on it, uh, we'll make sure that it gets into the channel that sends food to the civilians to help them overcome the starvation. Yes. Oh, that'd be great. St. Paul's so and Nuba. Thank Thanks. you.